Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to this session on studying a topic in biochemistry. Myself, Chandrika Nayak from the Department of Biochemistry at Manipal Academy of Higher Education. Today's topic in biochemistry that we shall learn is the formation and fate of bilirubin. Now this bilirubin is a pigment. It's also referred to as the bile pigment. It's yellow in color and when we think of any clinical condition where there is yellowing of the sclera, yellowing of the nail bed or yellowing of the skin, it's definitely we remember it as icterus or jaundice. But how is this pigment produced in the body? Do we normally produce this pigment? or? Is it only under certain conditions that we produce? We need to clarify certain points as to whether it was excess production of bilirubin or a sudden production of bilirubin. So all these thoughts or queries can be clarified if we know the formation and the fate of this bile pigment called bilirubin. So today's topic shall be formation and fate of bilirubin. So let's define the learning goals. If we have to study how is bilirubin formed and how is it metabolized, we'll go stepwise. First and foremost, we need to know the source of hemoproteins. Where does heme come from? Where are these heme proteins? What will happen to these heme proteins on degradation? Next, we need to know which is the major source. We will have definitely a variety of hemoproteins, but which one among them is the major source? Once you have identified the hemoprotein, you know where heme comes from, it's time to study formation of bilirubin and the fate of bilirubin. So step number one, formation of bilirubin. Step number two, transport of this bilirubin in the blood. It will be produced in one site, but it will be metabolized in another site. So the in between channel is blood. So how is bilirubin transported through the blood? And then who is going to take up this? This unconjugated bilirubin is taken up by liver. So step number three, conjugation, sorry, uptake of conjugated bilirubin. And once liver has taken it up, step number four, and that is liver will try to make it water soluble or liver will make it conjugated. So step number four is conjugation of bilirubin in the liver. And then once conjugation is over in the liver, what does liver do with this bilirubin? It will not keep it inside the liver. Now the liver will just secrete it out where to liver secretes it. So step number five is secretion of conjugated bilirubin to the bile. We all know that from the liver there is something called as the biliary ducts which will open up into the intestine. So secretion into the bile is step five and the final step you have secreted it into the bile duct it has come into the intestine that brings us to the last step in the fate of bilirubin that is formation of urobilins in the intestine and its fate. We all know that a urine is yellow in color and the feces is brown in color. Today we need to understand as to why is the urine normally yellow in color and why are the stools of feces brown in color. So everything will be clarified once we clearly define and understand these learning objectives. So let's begin with the first thing first, that is heme. 
where does it come from? It's hidden along with proteins. Now these are called as the hemoproteins. So let's list the sources of hemoproteins. The major source of hemoprotein is hemoglobin. And hemoglobin is found in the RBCs. So the red blood cells have hemoglobin. What are the minor sources? A muscle looks red due to myoglobin. What is myoglobin made up of? It's made up of heme. So second important source is myoglobin of the muscle. There are some other minor sources that is we have the liver with its cytochrome system in place. What are cytochromes? Hemoproteins. They also contain lots of heme. And then some minor sources like that the cytochromes of the ETC or catalases or tryptophan pyrolases. Now these are all the major and the minor sources of hemoproteins. So with that we move forward. Our focus is on hemoglobin. I told you there are four chains. It's a tetrameric protein. Tetrameric in the sense it has four globin chains. So if you look at this molecule you have globin number 1, 2, 3 and 4. Now these are the four globin chains. But the globin chains are not of interest in today's topic because that is the protein portion. If you degrade it, it will just give you amino acids. But our focus today is on the pigment called bilirubin. Now if we have to get this bilirubin pigment, we need to focus on the heme portion. So just focus yourself into this slide where you can see this molecule. So if you look at the molecule, there are green portions hidden inside the globin. So there are four hemes hidden. Now each heme is made up of a ring. So I repeat, hemoglobin is a protein made up of heme and globins. Four globins, two alpha globins, two beta globins, together four chains. Each chain contains its own heme. So if you look into this slide, into the structure, there are hemes hidden in the pocket of the globin. You can see the fluorescent green colored rings there. They are the hemes. So let us le quickly study the heme ring because it is important to proceed further how we get our important pigment bilirubin. Heme has a ring structure. The structure is called protoporphyrin 9. I would like you to focus on the slide where we will slowly try to build up this protoporphyrin 9 ring system. This is a pyrrole ring. In heme or protoporphyrin 9, there are four such pyrrole rings. Ring number 1, pyrrole ring number 2, 3 and 4. Each pyrrole ring has a nitrogen atom. So there are four nitrogen atoms focused towards the center of the ring. Now the rings should be held together by methanyl bridges. So you can look at the slide now. It is all held together by the methanyl bridges. And then you need to name these pyrrole rings. So you have to remember there are substituents on the heme ring. So you have the methyl group substituted on ring A, B, C and D. And then you have vinyl or the propionyl groups. So you have ring A. B, C and D and then iron in the center of the ring. So iron is found in the center of the protoporphyrin 9. So protoporphyrin 9 with iron is together making up what is called as heme and when heme combines with globin it becomes hemoglobin. So this structure is a perfect ring. It imparts red color due to the presence of iron in Fe2 plus form. If iron changes its Fe2 plus form to 3 plus form, the color is changed. It is not the heme, it becomes hemine. So what you need to focus is this open uh, uh, cyclic ring structure, when you open up, you get bilirubin. So we will focus now on formation of bilirubin. So where does it take place? Where do we produce bilirubin? It is in the reticuloendothelial system. We have the macrophages present either in the spleen, liver or bone marrow and that is the site of the um, bilirubin formation which is the subcellular site. 
it is all microsomal or endoplasmic reticulum. Endoplasmic reticulum and microsomes are synonyms. So, it takes place in the endoplasmic reticulum, so subcellular site. Then comes precursors, where do you get it from? 85 percent from heme of the hemoglobin in RBCs, 15 percent from all the other sources. So, again we will focus on the step number 1, I have labeled it for you, if you look at this slide, I have drawn a macrophage for you and it is inside this macrophage that the bilirubin is produced. So, focus now is on step number 1, formation of bilirubin. Heme comes into the macrophages, heme is first converted inside the endoplasmic reticulum into what is called as biliverdin. Biliverdin I have shown here in green color. Now, that is because it is a green colored bile pigment. What is the name of the enzyme that acts on heme? Heme is acted upon by an enzyme called heme oxygenase. Oxygenase that means oxygen is added. In fact, three oxygen st oxygenation steps are there. It is produced or converted into biliverdin by a three step process whereby adding oxygen you are actually opening the ring and when you open it up it becomes a straight chain compound. Now, you need hydrogen ions also for this, you get it from NADPH. So, if you look at the slide it needs oxygen, it needs NADPH, and what does it produce? It releases iron, it releases carbon monoxide and it also releases biliverdin. So, the biliverdin or the green colored pigment is ready and now comes what is conversion of biliverdin to bilirubin. Bilirubin is a yellow color pigment. Biliverdin reductase is the enzyme that converts the green pigment to the yellow pigment. It is reductase that means you need hydrogen. Who is the source of hydrogen? It is NADPH. So, it is a two step process. So, formation of bilirubin is a two step process where there is production of bilirubin. So, liver, spleen, these reticular endothelial system have produced the bilirubin. So, let us proceed to the second stage of this topic that is bilirubin is thrown out into the blood. Now, bilirubin that comes out is called unconjugated bilirubin. That means, it is not conjugated to anyone. It is hydrophobic. We know that blood nearly about 90 percent or more is water in blood. So, if any compound has to move in the blood, it should be soluble in blood, but there is a problem for unconjugated bilirubin. It cannot uh, move in the blood because it is hydrophobic, it hates water. So, how do we transport unconjugated bilirubin? we have a carrier, a boat to carry it in the stream of blood and that is albumin. So, unconjugated bilirubin is water insoluble, it hates water, hydrophobic. And remember, it is cytotoxic also. You know why? Because unconjugated bilirubin, since it is hydrophobic, it can easily cross the cell membrane and get into any cell. Now, in children or neonates, newborns, we see when they are born, we see them kept in some chambers because we say that they have excess uh, bilirubin, jaundice, neonatal jaundice we say. You have to remember when unconjugated bilirubin is high in this neonate, it can cross the blood brain barrier and get into the brain of that neonate or the newborn and cause brain damage to the newborn child and that is called carnicterus. So, remember unconjugated bilirubin is very dangerous, it can cross the uh, cell membrane and get into a cell and become cytotoxic. So, to prevent all this, what do we have in the blood? We have somebody to help us from all this danger and that is the plasma protein albumin. What does albumin do? Albumin catches hold of this unconjugated bilirubin and moves in the bloodstream. So, it conjugates to albumin and is transported in the blood to the destination. And then remember unconjugated bilirubin needs albumin for transport, not just that, if you leave it free what will it do? It will cross the cell membrane and become toxic. 
so it can cross the blood brain barrier and just a while ago i was telling you how in a newborn child a jaundice there can cause carnectrus carnectrus is actually when bilirubin gets into the brain of the newborn it will damage the brain permanently so that's the condition and remember when you take certain drugs like sulfonylamides or salicylates what happens is they also want albumin to move around so when the drugs are there they will just push the uh, uh, bilirubin away and they will sit on the albumin so what's the problem so if you take drugs there is chances that your unconjugated bilirubin will be displaced so it's usually contraindicated during jaundice so if a person is having jaundice they will be asked not to take these drugs because it will damage their liver further it will damage them further so keep this in mind they can displace bilirubin from the albumin which of them salicylates and sulfonamides fine we move on to step number 3 first step formation of bilirubin step second step how is it transported transport in the blood step number 3 now i just told you bilirubin and albumin they are in the form of a complex so you have a look at the slide in this slide i have a liver drawn for you because liver is going to pick it up fine so it will be leading to the third step what's the third step bilirubin should be taken into the liver now how is it taken it is taken up by facilitated diffusion what do you mean by facilitated diffusion if you have a cell with a cell membrane there's a transporter and if you use a transporter or a protein to get your compound inside now that's called facilitated diffusion see so here also in the liver step number 3 unconjugated bilirubin will be brought into the liver by means of a facilitated transport so focus yourself on the slide once again so if you see here uptake is by facilitated diffusion so bilirubin comes into the liver so we move on to step number 4 bilirubin has come inside so it's time for the fourth step or conjugation in the liver now bilirubin is unconjugated you need to make it conjugated so conjugation is a two step process so if you look at this slide here you can see that conversion of unconjugated bilirubin to conjugated bilirubin is a two step process and what do you need for conjugation we need glucuronic acid who is the source of glucuronic acid it is udp glucuronic acid so step number 1 bilirubin becomes bilirubin monoglucuronide look at this slide bilirubin monoglucuronide step next step becomes bilirubin diglucuronide in both the steps you are adding glucuronic acid why are you adding glucuronic acid your intention is only one that is make bilirubin water soluble so you have made the conjugated bilirubin so we are done with the fourth step that is conjugation of bilirubin inside the liver what i have not shown here on the slide you can see i have just put an asterisk there and that means there is an enzyme and then enzyme is bilirubin udp glucuronyl transferase i repeat what's the enzyme that brings about conjugation in the liver bilirubin udp glucuronyl transferase what does it do it will convert unconjugated bilirubin to conjugated bilirubin it's making bilirubin water soluble that's it and remember we need uh, we know that jaundice can be due to variety of causes but one of the cause comes with birth some children are born with jaundice and throughout their life they have jaundice now what is this type of jaundice it's called the krigler najjar syndrome and what is krigler najjar syndrome there are a variety of severities in that it's called krigner najjar type 1 type 2 now that's because these children who are born do not have the enzyme that is bilirubin udp glucuronyl transferase they cannot conjugate the bilirubin properly and because of that they have to live with 
jaundice. Of course, the severe form if they have, they will die soon, but if they have the milder form of Kriglenaja syndrome, they can survive, but throughout they are susceptible to jaundice. That is the problem. There is one more disease called Gilbert's disease, which is also a genetic disease where throughout the life they will keep having jaundice. And we move on to the step 5. Step 5 is conjugated bilirubin is ready. You look at the slide, the conjugated bilirubin in the liver is ready, just need to push it out into the intestine. That takes to the 5 step, 5th step that is secretion into the bile. So, if you look at this picture on the slide there, it is ready to get into the bile. Now, I need to tell a little bit about the secretion of bile and that is it is not a simple process, it is active transport. That means, you need lots of energy to put it out. So, you use energy and then throw out the bilirubin into the bile. So, the fifth step is an active transport one and you should remember that from this process onwards it has moved out of the liver. So, it is getting into the bile. So, we first secrete it into the bile canaliculi. The bile canaliculi will fuse together and form the bile duct. Bile duct joins with pancreatic duct and that will finally open into the small intestine. So, from the liver this pigment yellow pigment has slowly come into the intestine. Let us see what happens in the sixth phase of this topic. That is, what will happen to this pigment inside the intestine? It is come to the intestine now. So, step number 6 is intestine. I would like you to look at this slide. We have a liver there in place, we have an intestine drawn, we have shown a kidney because now our focus is what is the fate of urobilinogens? The urobilinogens in the intestine as you can see on the slide. They are not just going out into the feces, a part of it is actually reabsorbed. So, focus yourself on the slide here, see where the urobilinogen goes, it is taken up by the portal system and it goes to the liver and back to the intestine. So, this keeps happening, going to the liver, coming back to the intestine, this cyclic process goes on and on and on and that is called as enterohepatic circulation. Entero means intestine, hepatic means liver. So, urobilinogens will enter an enterohepatic circulation. So, thus urobilinogens have been reabsorbed or resecrated and this goes on, but that is only a part of it. But what happens to the other part? You have to remember when it comes to the liver, it can slowly get into the systemic circulation also. So, focus yourself on the slide. If you see that, it will come through the systemic circulation and then enter the kidneys. So, when it comes to the kidney, the kidney can filter out. So, urobilinogens can come into the kidneys and then to the urine and that is why the urobilinogens come in the urine and when urine is exposed to air, it becomes urobilin and that gives the typical yellow color to the urine. Only when you have a particular type of jaundice, if you have more urobilinogens, urine becomes still more dark yellow in color, otherwise it has the normal pale yellow color because all of us produce bilirubin every day. The problem comes only when we produce excess and that is jaundice. So, urobilinogen if you look at this slide has entered into the kidney and filtered into the urine. What happens to the other portion? How much sorry before that you just focus how much urobilinogens do we throw out every day? About 1 to 3.5 milligram per day that is it. And then the urobilinogen, if it remains in the intestine, so focus yourself on the intestine now, I have an additional information there, it gets converted to stercobilinogen and the stercobilinogen is the one that makes the stools or the feces look brown in color. So, how much stercobilinogen do we produce every day? It is given here, it is about 250 to 300 milligram per day and that is the reason in particular type of jaundice that is post hepatic jaundice we say what happens is the there is a block in the bile duct and the bile does not bring the bilirubin to the intestine. So, what is going to happen if there is obstruction at the bile duct if bilirubin does not come into the intestine no urobilinogen 
no stercobilinogen. So, patient suffering from such jaundice will have pale urine, pale feces. Their feces will actually look like clay that is white colored. They do not have stercobilinogen because there is a problem in the bile, gut, uh, bile duct, there is a block. So, bilirubin is not coming into the intestine. So, this is about the last step and that is formation of urobilinogen and stercobilinogen. So, plasma bilirubin if you see normally it is about 0.3 to 1 milligrams per deciliter. It can be unconjugated variety, it can be conjugated variety and how do we detect bilirubin? This is done by the Vandenberg's test. A little bit of talk about the Vandenberg's test. It is to distinguish the direct bilirubin from the indirect bilirubin. So, if you have direct bilirubin or conjugated bilirubin, you put it with this uh, sulfanilic acid which is diazotized, it will immediately give you the purple color. But if it is indirect bilirubin, what is going to happen? Unconjugated bilirubin first needs to be added with alcohol, otherwise it will not give you the color. So, look at the slide here, unconjugated bilirubin, sulfanilic acid, no color, but you put methanol, you will get the reddish purple color. So, that is called as indirect bilirubin. So, this is a test to distinguish direct bilirubin from indirect bilirubin. What is direct bilirubin? Conjugated. What is indirect bilirubin? It is unconjugated bilirubin. So, what is jaundice before we wind up? Plasma bilirubin levels, if it goes more than 1 milligram per deciliter, it is called hyperbilirubinemia. But if it goes about 2 milligrams per deciliter, it will deposit in the skin, the nail bud, eyes, it will make you look yellow and that is when we call it as ictrus or jaundice. So, plasma bilirubin level greater than 2 milligrams per deciliter is declared as a clinical condition jaundice. So, let us quickly summarize the formation and the fate. So, first we studied formation of bilirubin two step process, then we went on as to how is it transported in the blood along with the albumin. It. If it is not transported with albumin, it can get into the brain cause damage in a newborn. Then we studied how is it taken up by the liver, after that we saw how is it conjugated. We spoke a little bit about krigler naja syndrome and then we spoke about the secretion, how it comes into the bile and in the bile, in the intestine, how it became bilinogens. Whether it is urobilinogen or whether it is tercobilinogen, we saw the last step that is formation of urobilinogens. So, that is it for the summary. Let us just quickly look at one or two questions. Where did conjugation of bilirubin take place? Which was the major site? Was it erythrocytes, spleen, kidneys or liver? The answer is liver. Liver is the site. Next question, krigler naja syndrome is a consequence due to defect in what? What is the problem in krigler naja Is it the formation, uptake, conjugation or secretion? Definitely the third one. Conjugation of bilirubin is problematic. The third question, uptake of bilirubin is liver is by which of these mechanisms? Is it just simple diffusion, passive transport, active transport or is it facilitated? The answer is facilitated transport. And coming to the fourth question, which among the following plasma bilirubin levels indicate jaundice? How much should the bilirubin level be? Is it greater than 0.1, greater than 0.5, greater than 1 or greater than 2? The answer is it has to be greater than 2 milligrams per deciliter. That is when we declare a patient is said to have ictrus or jaundice. Thank you.